Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to SPI Health and Safety's webinar. My name is Amélie Leduc, and I'm a marketing advisor here at SPI. Thanks, uh, everybody, for being with us today. I'm very happy to be with you this afternoon and to discuss about gas detection. Uh, it's important for us to create awareness and even to educate you on how to adopt a preventive approach, always for the purpose of making sure that you and your workers go home healthy. Uh, today, I have the privilege to be accompanied by expert uh, that specializes in the field. First, we have uh, Harry Van Leeuwenkamp with us today. Hi, Harry. How, how are you? I'm great, thank you. Great, excellent. Thanks for being here. Um, Harry is our health and safety uh, trainer and advisor here at SPI. Uh, he has more than 40 years of experience, of which 25 years were spent uh, leading a team of first responders in 12 years where he oversees oversee, um, various plants and OHS committees. He has combined experience in consulting and hands-on management, uh, which actually gives him a, good, a great perspective on all of the confined space issues. Um, his ed educational background is actually in chemistry, uh, which provides him a strong ana ooh, sorry, <laughs> analytical abilities, which are very useful, obviously, in his professional activities. Uh, with us to Jason Morton from Drager. Hi, Jason. Hi, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, Jason joined Drager actually in January 20, uh, 2007 after he studied electronics engineering in Toronto. Uh, he's held, he has held several technical positions within Drager, uh, but most recently he's taken on the position of product support manager. Uh, for the Dreger's entire line of gas detection, respiratory protection, and diagnostics equipment. Uh, basically, Jason develops and provides uh, both product and application training for all of the users across Canada, across North America. So good. So I think you're in good hand today. Um, today's, uh, the webinar's goal actually is, uh, uh, like you have to keep in mind that this webinar is not an actual training uh, because it's we only have one hour, which usually we would have eight, uh, and we won't have time to go through all of the technical details. But the objective um, is for you to be able to validate, co uh, compare, and improve your knowledge in regards to gas detection, uh, as well as being able to select the best detector for your situation. So we do hope you will learn. Uh, we will learn a lot today uh, by with our webinar. Here's an overview, an overview of what we will be discussing during the webinar, so you know what to expect. Uh, first, we'll do a quick overview of the standard and regulation, uh, and also we'll discuss about the common mistakes and best practices. Uh, Jason from Dreger will explain the major differences and the importance of calibration and bump test. And finally, we will conclude with the reading interpretation as well as the Dreger's new XAM 8000 and the C CSC Connect uh, application. Uh, as I mentioned, this webinar will last for one hour. We will uh, answer your questions throughout the webinar, so feel free to ask. Uh, you may use the Q&A box on your screen. Uh, it's always fun to make it as interactive as possible. Uh, if you don't want, if you want to wait at the end, feel free. We'll have a question period. But if you, if we don't have time to answer a question, just make sure, uh, just be sure that we will be answering your questions on an individual basis after the webinar. Also, note that this webinar is being recorded, and you will be able to receive uh, the replay link uh, later on tomorrow or after tomorrow. So without further delay, let's start with our first interactive question. Uh, always to, in order to get to know you a li uh, to get to know a little more about you. So we want to know basically what are your main concerns regarding uh, regarding uh, gas detection. Sorry, just want to make sure it's working. We have a yeah okay. So we want to uh, sorry about that. We have a little uh, <laughs> technology. Um, uh, glitch. glitch, yes, there you go. Uh, technology is nice, sometimes glitch happens. <laughs> so basically, you want to know what are your main concerns regarding gas detection uh, between, is it the air testing procedures? Is it about the maintenance, the calibration, and bump testing? Uh, is it about training? Uh, is it the selection of PPEs or the ventilation? Or are you more concerned about legal requirements? So we're just going to make sure that those questions will pull up on your screen in just a second. 
Okay, so we may come back to this slide. Unfortunately, we have a, a technological a technological a glitch, so we'll we'll we will move on to the next uh, to the next slide. <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, well, actually, uh, Harry, why should we perform atmospheric monitoring? Well, certainly, you want to comply with regulations. I think everybody would agree with that, and also. Primarily, it's because there are atmospheric hazards that are possible. The gas detector allows us to ensure, as opposed to assume, the verification and maintenance of normal atmospheric conditions. We do not want to endanger the life and health of entrants. Atmospheric hazards are often colorless and odorless, and even when there is an odor, we cannot determine if this odor is in fact hazardous. Um, gas detection allows us to identify the presence and the concentration of contaminants that can and cannot be detected by our senses and warn us in case of danger. Moreover, in the context of the, the tasks performed in the confined space, there are four particular conditions to consider. The first one, is there a potential of an atmospheric hazard in the confined space due to its previous contents, for example, a chemical tank? Are the tasks performed likely to change the atmospheric composition, such as welding, which is a classic example, also the use of various solvents? The third one, will the tools or products that we brought into the confined space change the composition of the air, for example, an electric tool or a cleaning product? And the fourth source that we have to consider, are the activities or conditions outside the confined space likely to have an impact on the air quality inside the confined space, for example, a vehicle running or another hazardous task nearby. Thanks, Harry. Um, I think we're good. We're, we're back on track with our technolo technological glitch. So we'll go back to our interactive question, as it's important for us to understand what are your main concern and make sure that as we go along the presentation, we're allowed, we're, we're able to focus on on what basically would be more important to you. So uh, you will have uh, popping up on your screen right now the four, the five concerns that you may be, uh, the five areas or topics you may be more concerned. So please uh, pick one between A, B, C, D, and E. We'll give you a few seconds. Yeah, a few more seconds. Perfect. All right. So if we look at the results, thanks everybody for uh, your patience and for joining in the the interactive question. So 50% are more concerned about training, which is interesting. 17% uh, uh, about air testing procedures, and I guess 17% about maintenance. There was another glitch there, which we're not sure if we, if it, which answer. But and the last one would be uh, the selection of PPE and ventilation. Nobody's concerned about legal requirements compared to our other webinar before, where training was not such uh, a concern. I guess. Um, are you surprised with the uh, with these results? Yeah. Um, no, actually, it's. Uh... I see there's a, when I do my training sessions that there is a, a large interest in the group. And okay. at the end of the course, I often have a high degree of satisfaction. Yeah, people need to yeah. be trained on that. Yes, and you know, from a manufacturer's perspective, we get more and more requests for training on specific equipment. Um, however, you know, the equipment training is only one aspect of uh, the whole training program with regards to application training, which is something that you guys provide. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, actually, uh, SPI, yeah. Well, Ari, you're in our department, <laughs> our training and consulting. So, perfect. Thanks, everybody, for uh, for uh, for joining that question. So, we'll get back to the presentation. So, we discussed that. Okay, so we're about to, okay, so now we're going to talk about myth and truth, basically. Um, so, we know that many elements can affect the gas detector's readings. Uh, what must be understood, actually, is that some of, there are myths and there are truths. And we've made a, a, sh a short list of items that uh, Jason, Harry, and I will discuss, basically to determine if there are myths or realities. 
So the first one is uh, the detector calibrates itself. Is that a myth or a reality? Well, Harry, if you don't mind, I'll answer this one because this is an interesting one where it's actually both a myth and a truth because a lot of people confuse zeroing the sensors with calibration. And a lot of detectors can actually, when they're powered up, they can perform a zero calibration and they can say, yes, there it calibrates itself. On the other hand, that's more of a myth because they're not actually calibrating with any known concentration of gas. However, if they place it into a calibration station and they press calibrate and say there, it calibrates itself, that would be the true side of it. Okay, that's uh, interesting. Uh, another myth is if the detector has not alarmed, it's completely safe. Harry? I would have to say that this is a myth. The detector may display values that are below alarm thresholds and workers might still be at risk. We'll see examples for, further on in this webinar. Okay, a third one uh, is, is it, oh, sorry, is it important to bump test the detector before it is used? Yes, is that, that what, sorry, Jason, is that what guarantees the operation or? Absolutely, that's the truth. Um, it's the only way to know if the gas detector is working correctly, both whether it's measuring the concentrations of gas correctly, as well as that the alarms are activating and activating at the appropriate levels. Okay. Uh, the last but not the least, if I provide a detector to a worker, uh, I protect myself and I protect him because when it alarms, it only only then will it will he have to get out of the confined space. He does not need any additional knowledge. Myth or reality? Well, this is clearly a myth for me. Uh, provincial and federal regulations are clear on the subject. Gas detection is considered an assessment of, an, of a hazard. People who evaluate and control rel relative hazards must be qualified. Hmm. Emily, this might surprise you. Very often the training or the information provided is limited to word of mouth or to come, I'll show you how to do this. The information is incomplete and as a result, major errors are made when testing contaminants. We don't often get enough of the information that are, is, is essential. These errors can create a false sense of safety and would put workers in danger. I could ask the participants of this webinar, how many times have you said or heard, as long as the detector does not alarm, everything is fine? Sooner or later, this belief will trip you up. Yeah, and Harry, you know what? If I let you continue on the myths and realities, I think we could spend the whole webinar on that, oh, correct? I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> I think we better limit ourselves to just these few. <laughs> yes, we will. Thank you, Harry. Thanks, Jason. Um, let's take a couple minutes here to ask some more questions uh, to you, uh, our audience. Um, for you, we want to know, basically, another interactive question will pop up on your screen. We want to know for you, what is gas detection? Is it A, an essential step to ensure worker safety for any confined space entry? Is it B, simply a regula regulatory requirement? C, uh, it means that as long as there is no alarm, everything's fine? D, I'm not sure I have the appropriate detector. I would need more information. Or E, it hasn't been implemented properly and I would need more training. So we'll give you a few uh, seconds to answer again. Perfect. Okay, so okay, so it's 80-20, the rule. 80% <laughs> of you folks think uh, uh, gas detection is an essential step to ensure worker safety for any confined space entry. And 20% have mentioned that it hasn't been implemented properly and would need more training. I, goes, I think it goes hand in hand with our first question, where training was a big concern for... Oh yeah, and I'm not surprised by this because most people understand now that gas detection is an essential element. Now we have to understand all the aspects of gas detection and how to interpret these results. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. We'll have a, we'll put you in a situation. For instance, your gas monitor displays various value values, but there's no alarm. So what does it mean for you? Does it mean A, you know your workers will evacuate the confined space and call you? B, as long as you comply with standards and regulations, your workers will be fine? Is it C, that this happens all the time without any problems, so we're not too worried? Or is it D, you didn't know that this could possibly be a dangerous situation? We'll give you a few seconds again to answer.
a few more seconds. All right. Okay, so six, now again, it's very uh, like one or two answers. So 60% of uh, people say that as long as you comply with standards and regulations, your workers will be fine. Where 40% uh, mentioned that they didn't know this could possibly be a dangerous situation. What does that tell you? Uh, oh, well, guys? this is clearly, this is what I see out in the field as well. I see this all the time where people feel that as long as the detector is not alarming, we're fine. Uh -huh. And in fact, you should be paying close attention to the values that are, are on your screen because changing values values could indicate that there's something's happening in the confined space and you would prefer to get out so this is something that we cover in our in our training sessions and we go into it into some great detail okay yeah and you know it could be that you have a gas monitor with uh, specific sensors to measure specific gases um, but there's an unknown hazard that's been <clears throat> excuse me, there's an unknown hazard that's been introduced. Now, your gas monitor might not specifically display the concentration of that gas, uh, but it will affect the readings of the other sensors. And that's something I think Carrie's going to cover further in the presentation. Yes, definitely. Absolutely. Good. Thanks again, uh, everybody, for uh, answering our questions. So I guess we'll get into standards and regulations. Not too much. People have mentioned earlier that they were not too concerned about that, but we still want to address a few things about We'll that. go over it very briefly here. Yeah. Um, all federal and provincial regulations and the CSA standard address atmospheric conditions, whether they be likely, probable, possible, or potential. Some promises, promises also include codes of practice to help us do the right thing. In addition, it's important to respect the requirements and recommendations issued by the manufacturers. There are requirements for sampling frequency, lower and upper limits to be respected, and what to do in case of an alarm. Failure to comply with the detection requirements, alarms, and manufacturer's requirements could lead to serious accidents. This could lead to possible prosecution. And this leads us to the Bill C-21 that I think most people are, are aware of what the BCL C-21 is now. It's the, uh, it was adopted on March 31st, 2004, um, amending the Canadian Criminal Code. It's intended to make organizations and individuals in positions of responsibility accountable when breaches are established or when acts of negligence result in serious bodily injury or the death of individuals. The case of the Westray mine in 1992, the mine was the site of a methane explosion that killed all 26 miners. So we often call this law, we used to call it the Westray uh, bill. Hmm. It's sad that we have to call a bill after such a tragedy. Yeah, it's what we've seen in the past is that often it took an accident before things got changed. Yeah. We hope we work now more in prevention mode. Definitely. Okay. Um, what are the observations that must be made in relation to or to different regulations? Well, Clearly, they are neither black and white. They're written in layman's language. They leave room for interpretation. They say what to do. Now, every organization has to develop procedures and programs that explains who will do it and how to do it. They identify the requirements, not the practices. We must aim to be superior to the regulations because these are only minimum thresholds. There are two CSA standards that may interest the participants. There is the CSA Z1006-16 standard on the management of work in confined spaces. The second is CSA C22.2, number 152-FM. It's the 1984 reviewed in, 19, in 2016, which covers the construction, performance, and testing of portable and stationary electrical appliances for detection of combustible gas or vapor concentrations in air, some of which may be installed or used in class one hazardous locations. When you turn over your detector, you'll see this uh, standard uh, listed there. I don't want to go into too much detail, but just to tell people that when they look at the back of the gas detector, they will see the standard. That's a good thing. In a few words, the regulations say what to do. The standard says how to do it. The two are, in fact, complementary. Um, Harry, um, we can see on the slide uh, the, the threshold limit value or the TLV. What What is it actually? Well, it's the maximum concentration that unprotected workers can be exposed to in an eight-hour shift over a 40-hour work week. 
there is an American organization called the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists. This body sets out standards, including the TLV or the threshold limit values. In many cases, the elements presented in this guide are more restrictive than in some provincial regulations, but they are not uh, they do not consider the force of law unless they are, they are specifically referenced in the regulations. Okay. And some provinces actually do reference these, these, uh, this, uh, this book itself. Okay, interesting. So now we will talk about the 10 common mistakes to avoid during uh, sampling or testing, as if you prefer to call it testing. Um, so there have been several things we observed, uh, I think, when you folks sit with your clients, uh, such as major errors are made with testing contaminants. So these errors actually create a false sense of security and could definitely put our workers uh, in danger. So let's talk about the first one. Uh, so the first common mistake is personnel testing for contaminants are not qualified. Yeah, we talked about this earlier. User training is a, is a crucial element. Although essential, this training should not be limited to simply knowing how the instruments work. It must touch on other aspects. Then common, numbers, common mistakes number two. Uh, the environment to be tested are not known to stakeholders. Yes, so the testing will differ depending on many factors, such as what do they actually want to measure, what types of hazards are they likely to find in this particular place? And what possible atmosphere contaminants they might run into? All right. The third one, the instrument used is not always functional and adapted to contaminants potentially present. For example, do I have the right detector in my hand? The instruments are not suitable for all contexts. A device that measures all gases does not exist. Number four, instrument alarms are not adjusted according to regulations. Yeah, this is a common thing that we see, um, and most frequently with oxygen, uh, specifically around the alarm setting for supposed to be at 23, but it's actually set at 23.5. Then again, it can be with other toxic gas sensors as well, as those limit values can be different depending on what province you're in or even what industry that you're in. Okay. Mistake number five, the characteristics of the detection instruments are not known. For example, what is the response time of the detector? How long does it take for the instrument to display the correct reading? This time will be increased if I use a pump with a tube of a certain length. What are the temperature limitations? And so on. It's important to refer to the manufacturer's manual. Definitely. Number six, uh, one sometimes hears as long as the detector does not alarm, everything is fine. We've just talked about it actually earlier in the presentation, but it's still a common mistake. Yeah, so, you know, it's part of the interpretation of the value. So understanding, you know, if my oxygen value is a little bit low, well, why is it low? Asking yourself questions, you know, what could be introduced into this area that's going to reduce my oxygen level um, might not trigger an alarm, but still could affect the worker safety. Mm -hmm. Number seven. Interpretation was not always adequate. This factor is probably the key element. The user must be able to question the values obtained or to make a certain judgment to confirm that the values obtained reflect the atmosphere tested or its environment. Do not solely rely on alarm limits as they do not guarantee the absolute safety of the people or the workers inside the confined space. Number eight. Uh, did not apply correction factor for combustible gases. Yeah, this is something um, that a number of users still have an issue with, where a combustible gas sensor is designed to measure any combustible gas that's present. However, it's calibrated to one specific gas, such as methane. If the sensor sees another gas, maybe propane or something else, uh, it may give an indication but require the application of a correction factor to know what the true value is. Uh, if there's still ambiguity about that, uh, I, like if people are not exactly sure what this means, who could they contact? So, so they can contact either SPI or Drager. So as a manufacturer, we have our correction factors list for our sensors. But of course, if using another manufacturer, they'd have to contact that manufacturer for the correction factor list. Yeah. And SPI can, can go uh, oh, yeah. yeah, hands on and help. Oh, yeah, okay. absolutely. Perfect. Mistake number nine. Uh, did not take into consideration possible interference. Okay, very often the detector alarms and the users do not know the reason. There are some interferences that are known 
what you need to do is to uh, consult the manufacturer's data sheet to see if you are using some solvents or products that can have these interferences with your detector. The interference can result in a false positive or a false negative on your detector. And, and, and what that means is that the number on your screen may appear to be negative, and that is a false indication, of course, due to an, some, some unknown solvent. Definitely, that's dangerous. <laughs> The last but not the least, obviously, is um, the la it's we cannot like we can observe this one in the testing method is having an, an inappropriate testing method. Exactly. So when we're doing testing, we're testing in a vertical mode quite often. The tube does not always make it all the way down to the bottom. So this would be considered a serious error. The testing at a specific location only, when you're testing just inside the uh, manhole or you drop it down right to the bottom right away, this would be an error because gases are actually in various densities. Horizontal testing, near the opening only, you would want to do it throughout the entire confined space. Testing only inside the chimney effect. Now this chimney effect can take place when you have an opening at the bottom and you have an opening at the top and now we have a column of air that is flowing up and you're testing inside that column of air. You're actually testing the air that's outside the confined space. So this would also be a, a serious error. Or testing with a ventilator in operation. You may be testing the air coming out of this ventilator instead of testing the air in the confined space. Interesting. Um, Harry, how can we help organizations to have better gas detection practices? Because I think it's the core of, uh, of this discussion is yeah. absolutely, yeah. Several elements can be put into place within organizations to ensure proper gas detection. And we will see them in these next slides. Okay. First of all, we have seen previously that it is important to know where the contaminants come from in a confined space. However, it may also apply to other testing locations. It's, in, it's in, essential to know, one, is the contaminant present in the confined space before entering? For example, the confined space already contains hydrogen sulfide gas, or H2S. Can, number two, can the contaminant be generated by the work in the confined space, the tasks that were being performed? For example, argon welding will create an atmospheric hazard. Does the contaminant come from the area surrounding the confined space? It has no connection necessarily with the confined space, but the co-activity around the testing location can affect the people working inside my confined space. For example, the presence of a vehicle running nearby or other, other hazardous work being performed. And the, force, the fourth source of, uh, of uh, atmospheric hazards is, did the worker enter with an unauthorized product or tool into the confined space? For example, some brake cleaner. He's going in to do some welding. He doesn't need brake cleaner, but sometimes they bring it in anyways because it does a good cleaning job before we get started. Or even electric tool. Amelie, user, user training is a crucial element. Although essential, this training should not be limited to knowing the functioning, the characteristics and particularities of the instrument used. And talking about the instrument used, Jason will be talking about the instruments that they, about the instruments available, especially the Draeger XAM 8000 gas monitor. It must also touch on other aspects. We saw previously that the knowledge of, of potential atmospheric hazards and their characteristics is essential. That is essential to be able to identify sources of these hazards, whether it is the lack or the surplus of oxygen, as well as toxic or explosive gases or vapors. We need to know how to access the additional, additional information available in the detector, but also to know how to perform the testing with the appropriate instrument. It is important also to include in the training, what are the steps to follow in case of triggering, triggering an alarm? What preventive measures must we apply? The detection, the gas detection will give us an idea as to what are the PPE that we want to use and what is the type of ventilation that we want to apply. The interpretation of the results is certainly a key element. The choice of the detector with the right sensors is essential depending on the presence of the contaminants present. And the hazardous assessment, the hazard assessment would be uh, where we would determine what these are and also those generated by the, the, uh, the tasks that we're going to be performing. How many times have testers attempted detecting contaminants for which the device did not have the right sensors? because if a device had all the sensors for all these gases, we would have it. 
-hmm. and we don't. <laughs> Drager can certainly help you to educate you on this. In addition, too often, continuous detection has been observed where the instrument or sampling hoses in the case where the detector remains outside, be far from the work area and therefore far from the breathing zone. This would not be a correct way of, uh, of gas testing. Often, the remark made by users is when the instrument is near the area, it alarms all the time without necessarily asking why. It is extremely important to understand these three elements. Even today, we commonly observe that the people do not understand their importance. The length and the type of pump and tube that were that is being used. The length of the tube uh, used is important because many times the sampling tube does not even reach the bottom for lack of length. The CSA Z1006 suggests in section 8.1.8.2 to allow two to three minutes uh, uh, for each uh, point tested, to allow the stabilization of sensors and to ensure more accurate readings. This is in the CSA standard. When testing horizontally, it is important to evaluate using a pump and a probe to avoid sampling near the opening only. To avoid the chimney effect that is caused when an opening is also present at the top of the confined space and sampling is done from, from below. And even in horizontal set, uh, testing, it is important to consider the density of the contaminants. Contaminants can have many densities and they will be found at many locations, many heights of the confined space. We saw previously in the webinar that there are three com that there are, were many common errors during detection. I will present one, but I will turn it into a best practice. Often, some, test, some testers do not use a sampling pump as we discussed. They rather hang the instrument and insert it into a confined space. I invite the, part, the participants to be attentive to the readings on the instrument when the apparatus descends in the confined space. <clears throat> First, we notice that the detector displays 20.9 for oxygen and zero for the other values. Subsequently, the, the values change as we approach the bottom. When you remove the instrument, the values are the same as they were at the beginning. This is normal. The instrument reads directly according to the space that it is testing. Just so you know, at the beginning, it did not show 20.9, it showed 20.5. But I guess the technology is not being on our side today did okay. not show the first guest monitor uh, 20.9. Okay. So sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, well, we can see that even though the detector does not alarm, that we should be concerned with uh, the change in the oxygen values. So what must, what must we do? If we assume all is good, this would be a mistake. We must go to the appropriate screen or window to view the maximum values recorded by the instrument. When we pull the instrument out, we have seen that there's that back to 20.9. So what we want to do is go to the right page to see what are the peak values. We can notice on the next slides, the red arrow points to the peak value icon which is just to the right of the oxygen value. Be careful, do not forget to erase these peak values before testing starts. We wanna get rid of those so that we have the actual numbers of your confined space. One thing I would like to share with the participants is to have the perfect air testers kit. When going to the air testing location, it is important not to leave with just the instrument. You may be surprised when you arrive at the testing location or while testing. For example, there is water, water inside the confined space and inadvertently the filter touches the water. At this point, the instrument will sound an alarm because the pump will be blocked. Removing the filter and not replacing it may damage the unit. That is why you should have in your kit a waterproof replacement filters and a floating ball. This kit is a simple but important tool to save time and prevent instrument damage. Thank you, Harry. One of the other best practices is to also have a robust maintenance program. And with that comes um, some terms that people still have a little bit of issues with, such as fresh air calibration or zeroing, calibration using a standard certified gas or also called span or sensitivity calibration, and finally bump testing but it's extremely important that we understand what the difference is between these three different types of tests. For fresh air calibration or zeroing, it's an important step, but not always well understood. 
We find detectors at zero automatically when they're first turned on, but that's only applicable or only relevant if you're turned on in a fresh air environment. Because if you turn on in a contaminated area, what you're actually doing is setting a, a false negative on the, the detector sensors. And so again, just to reiterate, it must be a calibrated in uncontaminated atmosphere. So standing uh, beside a vehicle that's running with the exhaust coming out, it's not necessarily a fresh air environment or even sitting in the cab of your truck smoking a cigarette is not going to produce uh, the values that you're looking for. Or even sitting right beside your confined space. Yes, sitting right beside <laughs> your confined space as well. Next, we have the calibration or span or sensitivity calibration. And what you're actually doing with a span or sensitivity calibration is adjusting the sensor sensitivity. You're adjusting it to a certified standard cylinder or certified concentration. But when should you actually do the calibration? Well, of course, the manufacturer is going to have recommendations on the frequency of calibration for the sensors. Harry had mentioned the CSA C22.2. Uh, they also specify a calibration interval for combustible gas sensors. Uh, if the detector doesn't pass the bump test, or if the detector has been damaged, such as shocks, uh, falling, getting dropped, or uh, as Harry had mentioned, lowering it down on a rope, maybe they drop it all the way into the confined space. Um, but again, how would you do this? Um, so you would follow the manufacturer's recommendations, and you're going to choose gas according to this, uh, according um, to the Sorry, you're going to choose an appropriate gas based on the gas that you're looking to measure. Um, so I had mentioned earlier about the combustible gas sensor where it's going to measure any combustible gas. Uh, if you're looking to measure your hazard as propane, then you should be calibrating that sensor with propane. And then finally, bump test. When should we actually do a bump test? Again, it's going to be based on manufacturer's recommendations, such as prior to use or prior to safety sensitive measurements, uh, as well as following your company's SOPs, which could be based on legal requirements or uh, best practices. If the values are outside the specified tolerances, the detector must be calibrated to correct the accuracy of the readings. So some of the different test equipment that can be used. Uh, here you can see a simple bump test station. Uh, it contains no electronics. Essentially, as soon as the device is placed into the station, the bump test starts automatically. Uh, but it can also be used for calibrating the device. Again, bump testing is not the same as performing a calibration or span calibration of a detector. A little more advanced setup would be the XDOC system. So this can automatically perform any required tests. So if uh, a worker was placing a detector into the station uh, to do a simple bump test, not realizing that it was also due for a calibration, the station would automatically recognize this and perform the necessary tests. It also performs comprehensive sensor and alarm tests, such as checking the response time of the sensor, which we had indicated earlier, as well as the alarm test, because knowing that the sensor is going to measure correctly is one thing, but ensuring that your alarms are going to activate and activate at the correct levels are another thing. It can also be used to check the device configuration. And compared to a manual setup, such as the bump test station shown previously, it can reduce your gas consumption by up to 40%. That'd be pretty interesting for a lot of clients because these cylinders are quite expensive. Yeah, yeah definitely with the gas reduction. And uh, we see s huge savings on electronic systems like that. Um, but also just to point out the, the configuration of the device. So a lot of times they'll have a standard configuration for the equipment that's used on site. They might purchase some new equipment to add into their gas detection pool, uh, not knowing that the settings that it was received with differ from what they're supposed to have on their plan. So you can actually configure that station that if a detector is placed in and it doesn't have the correct settings, the settings are automatically overwritten without any, without any interaction from the user. Um. Before I have a question for you, Harry, but before I just want to reiterate to our audience that if you do have questions, feel free to ask them as we go along. Uh, Harry, um, what quantity of contaminants in PPM uh, can be found in the confined space if the oxygen indicates 20.0%? Okay, now here we have a situa situation where the detector did not alarm. Uh, so looking at the values displayed on the instrument, auction is at 20%, 20.0%. So how do we interpret that and how do we explain the situation during our training sessions? Well, we will see this in this next image, how to interpret the results. If, for example, auction is displaced by another gas, possibly toxic, are we actually in danger? To make it simpler, here is a quick trick, an easy trick. Whenever the auction goes down by 0.1%, it could actually present, represent a quantity of 5,000 ppm of this unknown gas. 
So whatever percentage change represents a huge number in PPM, parts per million. Definitely. So the measurement of oxygen must arouse our critical sense. One must not only rely on limit values or the 19.5 and the 23% that the alarms uh, will be triggered on on the detector. Jason and Ari, um, actually, maybe both you guys can answer that, but what can cause the reading on a gas detector to actually change? Well, first, the interpretation of the results is probably the key, key element. The people must be able to question the values obtained and make a judgment, confirm that the values obtained reflects the content of the air or its environment. You cannot solely rely on the alarm thresholds as they do not guarantee the complete safety of the entrance. The presence of a toxic, flammable or asphyxiating gas for which we do not have the proper sensors on the instrument can vary the readings and will indicate that maybe we should be getting out of this confined space, even if the alarm is not alarming. Yeah, and uh, one of the other points is uh, interference or cross sensitivity to another gas. So sensors are designed to measure one specific gas, but they might be affected by other gases that are present, which is what Harry had mentioned previously when he referred to the positive, sorry, the, the false positive or the false negative. Uh, of course, information on specific cross sensitivities can be found on the manufacturer's sensor data sheet. In addition to that, we also talked about correction factors for combustible gas sensors. It's important to consider them to ensure that you're getting accurate readings based on the gases that you're looking to measure. Again, I think, Harry, you have an example of this? Yeah, as we can see this in this next slide. Um, the, for some methane calibrated instruments, sampling of a confined space with a toluene, a toluene presence may indicate underestimated values. The correction fa factor for toluene is 2.1 for a methane calibrated uh, device. Therefore, the reading obtained must be multiplied by 2.1 to obtain the actual value of the LEL. If the sensor reads 50%, for example, the LEL times 2.1 therefore equals 105% LEL. Therefore, this environment is now explosive. Here we're talking about combustible gas levels, but measurements of lower concentrations may be required. For solvents, you could be measuring the concentration in PPM using a PID sensor in the Draeger's XAM 8000 device. Herring, earlier on your list of items for the perfect air tester kit, uh, you had actually a pen and paper listed on there. I, I totally agree with you that that's an important uh, component of a, a perfect kit, we'll say. Uh, but are you aware of some of the other advancements that we have in gas detection? Well, I think I'm going to find out now. <laughs> <laughs> well, on, on the screen there, you can see on the left, you know, what most gas testers are used to is that they would be giving a, a, a physical piece of paper for their paperwork order to perform a specific measurement. They would take this work order in a gas monitor. They're going to proceed and perform the required measurements. They would jot down or record their measurement values on the work order and then return the completed work order. But today we live in a digital world, whether that means you have a smart home where you receive notification about your kids arriving home, uh, adjusting your thermostat with your smartphone, or even just to have instant access to information through the Internet. So why don't we have a connected workplace yet? So as it was mentioned earlier, the Draeger XM8000 was launched earlier this year, and it was specifically optimized for clearance measurements. It's capable of measuring up to seven gases simultaneously, which can limit the number of different gas monitors required for a specific job. Whether that means you had a gas monitor and a combination of color metric tubes, uh, the Draeger uh, XM8000, again, with being able to measure up to seven gases, can limit the number of pieces of equipment that need to be taken. It also has a built-in assistant mode. Um, so earlier, Harry, you had talked about the, the length of tubing as a consideration, as well as the response time of the sensors. With the assistant mode, you can actually select the length of tubing that you have. It'll look at the sensors that are installed and then give you a calculated purge time based on the individual sensor's response time and the length of tubing that you have. And actually, with the pump that's installed in this detector, it can sample from up to 45 meters away. But none of that really answers the question, what about a connected workplace? In addition to those other attributes, the XM8000 launched with an integrated Bluetooth module, which allows the device to be paired with a user's smartphone for automatic transmission of measurement data. So the accompanying application that can be used with the XM8000 is actually called CSE Connect, and it's available for Android and iOS devices. It allows your XM8000 to be paired with your smartphone, 
And you can use the app to simply send a report with the measured values from a specific measurement job. Or you can use CSE Connect Office, which is a web portal, to manage and transmit specific measurement jobs to individuals who have a smartphone with CSE Connect. So they don't have to go back to the office to grab a work order for a measurement job. They're out in the field already. You can simply log into the web portal, say they need to go to a specific location, perform a specific measurement, and that's updated directly on the application. And they can go perform their measurements, and the values are transmitted back automatically. The measurement jobs on their smartphones include information on location, uh, location information, what type of measurement needs to put, take place, whether that's for specific gases or particulate counts, what gas, uh, sorry, uh, what gases need to be measured, what equipment or PPE is required. And again, once they receive this uh, information, they perform their measurements. And because of the Bluetooth pairing, everything's automatically transferred over to the application. Since the data is transferred electronically, it also reduces the possibility of having a work order that is incomplete or unreadable, which would require a new work order to be issued and a new measurement performed. Again, it's to eliminate the, the need to uh, all the, the traveling back and forth to pick up new work orders or in case of any issues. People are out in the field. A lot of these plants that they're, they're dealing with uh, are quite large. So it's just limiting the, the, the amount of time spent actually walking back and forth. That's very interesting. Okay. Thank you, uh, Jason, for explaining that into more detail. Um, in conclusion, maybe, I don't know if Harry, you want to add something or? Yeah, I guess I can conclude with, uh, it's important to evaluate your gas detection methods and your instruments. Seek advice on your needs. Don't hesitate to ask for technical help. There's always a solution to a problem and or challenge. We're here to support and guide you. Yes, uh, Jason, is there anything you want to add? Uh, yeah, so just uh, further to Harry's points there, you know, you know, if it's um, something that's already set up and you're unsure about, don't be embarrassed to ask, you know, whether it's SPI or Dragger, we're not here to get you in trouble, we're here to provide you with options. So if you have questions and you need a solution, that's what we're here to provide for you. Yes, absolutely, and I mean, Honestly, that's our mission at SPI, to be the most valuable partners for people who value health and safety in their organization. So it's always better to prevent than to actually uh, heal, right? Perfect. So now is the question, uh, period of question. I don't know if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask, but please if, feel free to do so. We'll have a few minutes uh, to be able to answer. Um, as we're waiting for questions to pop up, uh, just a reminder to that we will have a survey for you after the webinar. If you could please take a couple, uh, a few seconds uh, to answer it. It allows us to improve uh, how we do it and for in order to give you a, a better and better OHS webinars uh, that are always free and also to better target your needs and see what are your concerns and what we could be addressing in the future. Um, in terms of questions, uh, maybe you don't have some at this time and that's okay. If you do have questions that come to your mind, don't hesitate, send us an email. Uh, you will have my email address on the slide right now. I will be my pleasure. It will be my pleasure to transfer it to Harry or Jason uh, and have them answer back to you. Um, as we mentioned, need any more information, uh, just email us or call us and we hope that we will see you uh, in our next upcoming OHS webinar which is on December 12 on hand protection. So winter is just around the corner so have a wonderful day but please be safe on the road. Thank you very much Harry. Thank you Jason. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a, a wonderful day. <laughs> Good.